let's, let's, let's talk about the, the average life of a farmed fish. Well, I mean, it's not very interesting, let's face it. Um, and that's because, you know, the whole idea of positive welfare and enrichment and all those kind of things that we sometimes talk about in the context of, um, you know, pig farming or, or what have you, that, that concept hasn't even make it, made it to fish yet. Um, look, it's, 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 again, it's difficult to put all uh, aquaculture into one basket because mm -hmm. there are some really small family-owned um, businesses, which in, in some countries, like Italy, for example, is kind of the standard, uh, where they might have one or two ponds and they're rearing, you know, whatever it might be. At the other end of the scale, you have massive industrialised um, aquaculture that is basically run by multinationals in the same way that everything is these days. And in that case, you know, you basically got, well, let's, let's use salmon as the, as the example, because salmon's probably by volume and probably by um, value, it's probably the most um, important aquaculture um, sector. So in that case, it's, it's an interesting problem because salmon have a, a complex life cycle. They start off in freshwater and they end up in, in the marine environment. And so basically they often use uh, hormones to, to get the, the eggs and the, and the sperm from the adults. Uh, they're stripped so that basically they're artificially extracted from the animals. Sometimes that happens under sedation, sometimes it doesn't. The eggs and sperm are mixed, and then the fertilized eggs get stored in these big canisters, which are constantly got oxygen bubbling through them. And eventually, they're laid out in runways uh, where they hatch, and they're constantly sorted based on size. Uh, but the density is mind blowing. I mean, it's nothing remotely like what happens in the real world. The density is out of this world. Um, and eventually they, they get moved into progressively bigger and bigger um, tanks and, and, and things like that. But ultimately what happens is they, they move out to sea, to sea pens. And it's probably the, the sea pens that most people, um, I guess, equate to aquaculture because that's, that's the part of the operation that you can't miss, right? Everybody can see them. Mm. But basically huge nets um, in the in the near shore regions, usually in in, in, bay, in embayments and things like that, and again the density in those nets are astronomical. Um, of course, they're artificially fed uh, a, a huge amount of um, food. Uh, there are ecological problems associated with that because the waste products and, and so on go straight into the environment. But many countries have now regulations about where these farms can be because of the ecological impact on the marine environment. Of course, they, they have problems with parasites, particularly things like sea lice, um, which, you know, when you're keeping animals at any kind of density is always going to be a problem. That doesn't matter whether it's a terrestrial system or a, a marine system, whatever. Mm. Whenever animals are in high density, then there's going to be disease outbreaks. That's just the way it is. So the density is problematic. Um, so the, from a welfare perspective, the life of those animals is not very good. Um, do we have the capacity to keep them healthy? Yes, most of the time we can keep them healthy. Are they happy? Probably not. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think it'll be a fair way down the track before we um, can talk about, you know, positive experience and positive welfare in, in an aquaculture context, but don't get me wrong, we are having that conversation already. How long it takes that conversation to filter into, um, you know, actual production, it's gonna be a while, I, I suspect. But we're already developing um, welfare standards for aquaculture, um, which will work in much of the same way that, you know, you know, the tick of approval that you get for the RSBCA for your chicken or, or, or what have you. So there will be, um, in the not too distant future, um, standards that consumers can look for 
and know that at least some aspects of the fish's welfare has been taken care of. Mm. Now, people don't often think about that life experience, but I mean, salmon live for a long time, right? It can be a couple of years before they're ultimately harvested. Harvested, there's that word again. <laughs> it sounds like wheat. Um, and, but I think there's, there's really good progress now on, on that, that process. Um, lots of research has been done on how best to extract the fish, how to stun them, how to kill them, how to ensure that they're dead um, and, and that there's no lasting suffering at the time of, of killing. That's not to say that they haven't had, you know, a pretty boring life. Uh, and, and, but that's, that's a good case scenario. There are lots of scenarios where the quality of the life of the fish and the health of the fish is not um, the priority of the, of the, the, um, the industry or, or the particular company. Um, and I've seen some really shocking examples of that. Um, you know, dead fish everywhere, fish covered with lesions and, and fungal outbreaks and, and sea lice and, and God knows what else. So it can be it can be really bad, uh, as one would expect when you're um, keeping that many animals in, in such crazy densities. Uh, but look, my hope is in the near future those um, standards, the welfare standards, people will start to look for them. And, um, you know, when you go into the supermarket and you buy a product, look for the standards. Um, the RSPCA already has some in, in the UK. Uh, and there are a couple of others um, that are coming out in the near future. Um, ASC, for example, you know, they have a, uh, what do they call it, a sustainability standard at the moment, but they're about to incorporate a welfare standard with their sustainability standard. So it'll be sustainable and welfare um, uh, orientated at the same time. So I, I suspect that's the future. Uh, and much in the same way that, you know, we went from caged eggs to, to free range and what have you in the space of, you know, probably three or four years. Um, I was in the UK when that happened. You couldn't buy a, a caged egg in the UK. <laughs> it, went, it happened so fast. And it was dominated by caged eggs and then it was free range everything. Um, so that's going to happen and it'll happen, I think, in the next five, five to ten years. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking to one of my friends uh the other day about before before i had this conversation talking about fishes and we were talking about whether we whether we we're speculating about whether a fish can suffer from depression and there was something um, i was one of your articles i was reading where you talk about uh, a fish kind of giving up on life and like sinking down to the bottom can you describe that was this something that you saw yourself yeah well it's a it's a pretty universal thing and again this goes back to um the knowledge that our physiology is fundamentally the same right um, there, in fact, there's a branch of um, ecotoxicology, which is the study of the impact of all sorts of toxic chemicals in the environment uh, on animals primarily. And fishes are widely used as, as the canary for marine and freshwater environments from an ecotoxicology perspective. One branch of ecotoxicology specifically looks at the impact of pharmaceuticals um, it's not widely known, but pretty much every time you take some form of medicine, no matter what it is, your body processes some of it and assimilates some of it, but a good proportion of it passes straight out the other side. And yes, our um, sewage goes to wastewater treatment plants, but wastewater treatment plants are not designed to cope with pharmaceuticals, which means those pharmaceuticals pass ultimately into our freshwater and or marine environments. And the active ingredients of those pharmaceuticals are often still active. And given what we already know about the conservative nature of physiology, um, it will come as no surprise to people to discover that fishes and other aquatic organisms are deeply impacted by waste pharmaceuticals. The reason I'm talking about this is because we're specifically talking about anxiety. And one of the massive growth industries in the pharmaceutical context is antidepressants. Um, the per capita intake of antidepressants has skyrocketed uh, across the Western world in particular. 
um, which means that the concentrations in our marine and freshwater environments has gone up massively. And I could tell you there are probably 50 or more scientific papers specifically looking at the effects of antidepressants on fish behaviour. And it's not pretty. Um, so those antidepressants have pretty much the same impact on fish behaviour as they have on, on humans. Um, so we already know that fishes suffer stress and anxiety in the same way that, that, that we do. Uh, and depression can be uh, one outcome of that. Uh, they can also suffer from learned helplessness as most animals can, and that's another sign of, of depression. So, I mean, it's, it's a problem. Most people don't think about it, uh, but it's a problem that I think that we should think about in the context of aquaculture, but also the aquarium trade. Um, so, you know, you should not keep fish in a boring environment with no friends ever. Um, basically, you, sh you should keep them in a, in a, a realistic, natural-looking kind of environment, mix it up, keep it interesting, and, and make sure that they've got lots, lots of social um, you know, stimulation. Uh, in the same way as you, you, know, you look for yourself, you should be treating your, your um, pet fish in, in the same way. Uh, so I think that's, that's a, probably a take-home message that people don't take, <laughs> I guess, fish psychiatry very seriously. Mm. But you know, ultimately, if you're interested in the welfare of your pet fish or what have you, then you should be thinking about you know, environmental enrichment and, and social enrichment when, whenever possible. The fishes who are, just to touch on, on the fishes who are sinking to the bottom and giving up on life, what has happened to them? Is it, is it the chronic frustration, not being able to escape with a fish, not having enough space? Is it the lack of stimulation in their environment? Is it all of these Yeah, things? look, it can, it can be all of those things, mm. yeah. So, I mean, it's, <laughs> look, it, it doesn't happen. If you look after an animal reasonably well and you provide it with all the sorts of things we're talking about, then it's just not going to happen. Mm. But... Sadly, I, I dare say most people's first experience of keeping fish, um, they're inadequately, <laughs> inadequately prepared for the experience. Um, the, the aquarium is often too small. The water quality is often not good. Uh, people tend to, believe it or not, overlove their fish. They feed them too much. Mm -hmm. Um, fish are not like you and me, you know, their metabolism is a fraction of our own. Um, so they don't need much food. And the trouble with overfeeding them is that that food then sits on the bottom and rots and mm. it has a massive impact on the water quality. Right. We can talk about chemistry all day, but ultimately what happens is oxygen concentrations decline um, and you get a release of nitrogen and nitrates, which basically physically burns their gills. So you get a double whammy of reduced oxygen concentration and a reduction in the capacity for the gills to function. So it's a pretty nasty experience for fishes. So that's why water chemistry is such an, an important aspect of, of maintaining fishes. But again, you know, keeping them um, stimulated is really important. And there's some fantastic experiments that have looked at, just as we've done in zoos, the impact of environment enrichment in behavioural repertoire, cognitive learning capacities, and even brain morphology. And, and that clearly shows that if you enrich the environment, a fish's brain um, is stimulated, it's constantly turning over and growing, and their behavioural repertoire and cognitive capacity go up. Um, and it can happen rapidly, you know, so you can do something now. If your fish is in a boring environment, you can do something now and within a couple of weeks that, that the benefits of that will have been realised. When it comes to aquaculture, which is, I suppose, where the, the majority of these fish is giving up on life are, yeah. do you have any sense of how common it is? Look, it's difficult to know. I mean, I have um, colleagues that are vets that work for big aquaculture farms. Um, look, it's difficult to say, and it's also difficult to know what the primary cause of many of these things are. I, I would have hazard a guess that the vast majority of time, the primary cause um, 
is some kind of infection or physical illness or something like that. But let's not forget that your immune system is depressed when you're depressed. When you're, when you're suffering from stress and anxiety, your immune system takes a massive hit. And so again, it's a complicated, it's a complicated situation because it's difficult to know ultimately what killed the fish. Was it the stress and anxiety that reduced its immune system and it ultimately died of some fungal or bacterial infection? Or, or was it the bacteria or, or virus that, that killed them? And arguably, you know, it's difficult to separate those two things. But, you know, if they're in a good state of mind and their body is also physically healthy, uh, then that is the best case scenario for, for any animal and, and for people as well. Of course, you have to keep mentally stimulated and physically stimulated for long life.